I wept, um, I asked, O Agamemnon, king of men, what sort of cruel death hath rendered slain thy royal person? Neptune in thy fleet, heaven in his hellish billows, making meat, rousing the winds. Or have thy men by land done thee this ill, for using thy command past their consents to diminution for those full shares their worst had by lot had won by sheep of, or oxen? Or of any town in covetous strife to make their rights thine own in men or women prisoners? He replied, by none of these in any right I die, but by Aegisthus and my murderous wife, bid to a banquet at his house, my life had been thus reft me. To my slaughter led, like to an ox pretended to be fed, so miserably fell I, and with me my friends lay massacred, as when you see at any rich man's nuptials, shot or feast, about his kitchen white toothed swine lie dressed, the slaughterers of a world of men thine eyes, both private and in prees of enemies, have personally witnessed. But this one would all thy parts have broken into moan to see how strewed about our cups and cates as table set with feast. So we with fates all gashed and slain lay, all the floor imbrued with blood and brain. But that which most I rude flew from the heavy voice that Priam's seed Cassandra breathed, whom she that with doth feed with baneful crafts, false Clytemnestra slew, close sitting by me. Up my hands I threw from earth to heaven, and tumbling on my sword gave wretched life up, when the most abhorred by all her sex's shame forsook the room, nor deigned, though then so near this heavy home, to shut my lips or close my broken eyes. Nothing so heaped in, is with impieties, as such a woman that would kill her spouse that married her a maid. When to my house I brought her, hoping of love, her love and heart, to children, maids, and slaves, but she, in the art of only mischief hardy, nor, not alone cast on herself the foul aspersion, but loving Danes hereafter to their lords will bear, for good deeds, her bad thoughts and words. Alas, said I, that Jove should hate the lives of Atreus' seed so highly for their wives. For Menelaus' wife a number fell, for dangerous absence thine sent thee to hell. For this he answered, Do not be more kind than wise for, to thy wife. Never all thy mind let words express to her. Of all she knows, curbs for the worst still in thy self-repose. But thou by thy wife's wile shall lose no blood. Exceeding wise she is, and wise in good. Icarius' daughter chased Penelope. We left a young bride, when for battle we forsook the nuptial peace, and at her breast her first child sucking, who by this hour blessed, sits in the number of surviving men. And his bliss she hath that she can contain, and her bliss thou hast, that she is so wise. For by her wisdom thy returned eye shall see thy son, and he shall greet his sire with fitting welcome, when in my retire my wife denies mine eyes my son's dear sight, and from me will take from him the light. Before she adds one just delight to life on of her or her false wit out one truth that fits a wife. For her sake, therefore, let my harms advise that though thy wife be ne'er so chaste and wise, yet come not home to her in open view, with any ship or any personal show, but take close shore disguised, nor let her know, for tis no world to trust a woman now. But what says fame? Doth my son yet survive in Orchomen or Pylos? or doth live in Sparta with his uncle? Yet I see divine Orestes is not here with me. I answered, asking, Why does Atreus' son inquire of me, who yet arrived where none could give to these news of any certain wings? And tis absurd to tell uncertain things. Such sad speech passed us, and as thus we stood, with kind tears rendering unkind fortunes good, Achilles and Patroclus' soul appeared, and his soul, of whom never ill was heard, the good Antilochus, and the soul of him that all the Greeks passed, both for force and limb, excepting the unmatched Aesides, illustrious Ajax. 
But the first of these that saw, acknowledged, and saluted me was Thetis's conquering son, who, heavily his state was taking, said, Unworthy breath, what act yet mightier imagineth thy venturous spirit? How dost thou descend these under regions, where the dead man's end is to be looked on, and his foolish shade? I answered him, I was induced to invade these under parts, most excellent of Greece, to visit wise Tiresias for advice or virtue of, or of virtue to direct my voyage home to rugged Ithaca, since I would, since I could come to note in no place where Achaea stood and so lived ever, tortured with the blood in man's vain veins. Thou therefore, Thetis son, ha hast equaled all that ever yet have won the bliss that earth yields or hereafter shall. In life thy eminence was adored of all, even with the gods, and now, even dead, I see thy virtues propagate thy empery to a renewed life of command beneath. So great Achilles triumphs over death. This comfort of him, this encounter found. Urge not my death to me, nor rub that wound. I rather wish to live in earth a swain, or serve a swain for hire, that scarce can gain bread to sustain him, than that life once gone, of all the dead sway the imperial throne. But say, and of my son some comfort yield, if he goes on in first fights of the field, or lurks for safety in the obscure rear. Or of his father, if thy royal ear had... O, of my father, if thy royal ear have been advertised, that the Pythian throne still he still commands as greatest Myrmidon, or that the Phian and Thessalian ra ra rage, now feet and hands are in the hold of age, despise his empire, under whose bright under those bright rays in which heaven's fervor hurls about the days, must I no more shine his revenger now, such as a of old, the Ilian overthrow witnessed my anger, the universal host sending before me to this shady coast in fight for Grecia. Could I now resort, but for some small time, to my father's court, in spirit and power as then, those men should find my hands inaccessible, and of my f and of fire my mind that durst with all the numbers that are strong unseat his honor and suborn his wrong. This pitch still flew his spirit, though so low, and I answered thus. I do not know of blameless Peleus, any least report, but of your son, in all the utmost sort, I can inform your care with truth, and thus. From Skyros, princely Neoptolemus, by fleet I conveyed to the Greeks, where he was chief at both parts, when our gravity re retired to council, and our youth to fight. In council still so fiery was conceit in his quick apprehension of a cause, that first he ever spake, nor passed the laws or of any grave stay in his great haste. None would contend with him that counseled last, unless illustrious Nestor, he and I, would sometimes put a friendly contrary on his opinion. In our fights, the priests of great or common, he would never cease, but far before fight ever. No man there, for force he forced. He was slaughterer of many a brave man in a most dreadful fight. But one and other whom he reft of light in Grecian succor, I can neither name nor give in number. The particular fame of one man's slaughter, yet I must not pass. Eurypylus Telephides he was, that fell beneath him, and with him the, fall, the falls of so huge men went, that they showed like whales, Rampired about him, the Eptolemus set him so sharply for the sumptuous favors of mistresses he saw him wear. For all past doubt, his beauties no, had no peer of all that mine eyes noted, next to one, and that was Mem Memnon, Tithon's sun-like son. Thus far, for fight in public, may a taste give of his eminence, how far surpassed his spirit in private, where he was not seen, nor glory could be said to praise his spleen, this close note I excerpted. When we sat hid in Epius's horse, no optimate of all the Greeks there had the charge to open and shut the stratagem but I. My scope to note then each man's spirit in a strait of so much danger, much the better might be hit by me than others as provoked I shifted place still, when in some I smoked 
both privy, privy tremblings and close vent of tears. In him, yet not a soft conceit of theirs could all my search see, either his wet eyes plied still with wipings, or the goodly guise his person always put forth, in least part, by any tremblings, showed his touched at heart. But ever he was urging me to make way to their sally, by his sign to shake his sword hidden in his scabbard, or his lance loaded with iron at me. No good chance his thoughts to Troy intended. In the event, high Troy depopulate, he made assent to his fair ship, with prize and treasure store, safe and no touch away with him he bore a far off hurled lance and a close fought sword, whose wounds for, for favors war doth oft afford, which he, though sought, missed in war's closest wage, in close fights Mars doth never fight but rage.